Can you hear me in the yeah, back? No, no, no. Just, yeah. Okay. So let's take our seats and uh, get started. I want to welcome you today and uh, to this uh, very thought-provoking uh, panel, uh, an action-oriented group that we have. Uh, I'm Arthur Keyes, the President and CEO of International Relief and Development. Um, since 1998, our mission is to reduce the suffering of the world's most vulnerable people and to provide them with tools and resources for them to succeed and develop self-sufficiency. We specialize in meeting the needs of communities emerging from conflict and natural disaster. And over the last 14 years, we've done a lot of, become a major implementer of relief, stability, and development programs worldwide, including obviously dealing with Syrian refugees. I'd like to begin today by thanking the Middle East Institute and Ambassador Wendy Chamberlain, who unfortunately is not able to be with us today for co-hosting uh, this event. Uh, her leadership and MEI's leadership in atten getting attention to the, the Middle East uh, concerns is certainly very admirable. The humanitarian crisis due to the Syrian conflict deteriorates day by day. In early October, the UN reported 20,000 deaths. Some human rights groups uh, estimate 40,000 deaths due to this conflict. On the refugee front, as of Monday, UNHCR set the number of registered Syrian refugees at more than 450,000. And as we know, that number is increasing daily in Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and Iraq. And also, we know that there's significant displacement of Syrian citizens inside of Syria. Yet, we all must do more, which is why we're all here today, and we must act quickly. The situation appears to be at a tipping point, and I expect that today's panelists will discuss the ongoing challenges, including the approaching winter and growing regional instability. But I also hope we begin to talk about the next steps for Syria, both in terms of additional humanitarian assistance and support for the eventual transition to stability and longer-term rebuilding and economic development programming to the citizens of Syria. I believe we need to support established networks, but also we need to open new channels of assistance inside of Syria. Today, we've brought together several of the key actors in the hum U.S. humanitarian response, from the State Department, from USAID, from IRD, and especially uh, Ambassador Ford. I look forward to hearing what each panelist has to say into the undoubtedly lively discussion that we ask all of you to participate in. With that, I'll hand this over now to Ambassador Deborah Jones, MEI scholar and former U.S. Ambassador to Kuwait. Deborah has served the State Department in the United Arab Emirates, Ethiopia, Iraq, Argentina, and Syria. Her knowledge and experience will be a great addition to today's discussion as our moderator. She'll help guide us through this area. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, we also at MEI, we'd like to thank up the top uh, IRD for co-hosting us, and especially we'd like to thank our panelists for taking the time to join us today and to talk to you on such an important topic. I don't want to take much time now. I would, I, you all have bios of the panelists. You know that they each have distinguished backgrounds and each have had extensive work in areas of conflict uh, in recent past. So. Uh, I'll leave you to that so that we leave more time for Q's and A's. I only want to note that as all of you are aware, uh, AID Administrator Shaw was just in Turkey this last week um, meeting with refugees in the camps there. And also as we speak today, as we meet, Ann Richards of uh, PRM is in Lebanon right now and in the region also looking at ways we can work better with the neighbors, with Syria's neighbors to support this effort. So what we're going to do is I'll, we're, I'm going to turn it immediately over to Ambassador Ford. Um, we'll take uh, and we'll go in order down the panel. Ambassador Ford, uh, Albert uh, Sevalos from IRD, Mark Bartolino from USAID, and Kelly Clements from PRM. 
and then we will open it up for questions. I'll take bundles of three questions at a time. Please get your questions in order now because Ambassador Ford does have to leave fairly early on, so let's try to be as efficient as we can be, and sorry to rush it because it is a, a critical topic. Thanks, Robert. Good morning. Arthur, let me thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's a pleasure. And Deborah, thank you as well. Um, I'm going to talk for maybe about 10 minutes is all because I think um, questions back and forth are perhaps more enlightening. Um, let me just say a few things to launch the discussion this morning on a broad view of what's happening in Syria and the administration's response. First of all, Syria is a terrible human tragedy. Um, the military confrontation is ongoing between the regime's forces and different armed opposition groups. There's been a lot in the press recently about uh, gains that the armed opposition groups are making on the ground, and those gains are absolutely real. Um, that said, there is uh, no sign right now of any kind of political deal uh, to be worked out between the opposition groups and the regime, which means that the fighting is going to go on. The regime still retains substantial capabilities. Um, a lot of its units retain uh, real military capabilities. We see that with airstrikes that have targeted everything from bakeries and lines of people trying to buy bread uh, to hospitals. Uh, the Dar Shifa Hospital in Aleppo, which the New York Times did an article about last week, is only one example of many hospitals uh, that the regime has targeted specifically. Uh, that kind of thing is a genuine war crime. I have to say that as we look ahead, already the number of internally displaced people and the number of refugees, which has climbed so fast, uh, the prospect is it will continue to do so. When I was in Damascus before we closed the American Embassy last February, the number of refugees was about 15,000 scattered between Turkey, Jordan, and some in Lebanon. Uh, that number, 15,000 last February, is now somewhere in the neighborhood of 450,000. Um, Kelly Clements, my colleague from the State Department's Population, Refugees, and Migration Bureau, uh, can talk in greater detail. She was just on a visit to the region um, and visited some of the places. Um, but the number of refugees has climbed dramatically uh, just in 10 months, even less, nine months, um, posing real hardships not only on the refugees themselves, and in many cases uh, their conditions are very difficult, but also posing real challenges to the governments that are hosting them, uh, Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, and more and more also in Iraq, in northern and western Iraq. In addition, the number of internally displaced people has skyrocketed as the, the, just the sheer brutality of the fighting um, has intensified. And estimates now are that the number of displaced people has surpassed one million out of a population of only 23 million. And again, that number is climbing very quickly. We estimated when the embassy was still open last February uh, that the number of internally displaced people was in the neighborhood of 40 to 50,000. And we now think it's over a million. So you see how rapid that progression is because of the intensification of the fighting. And I do not have good news that that fighting is likely to de-intensify anytime soon. Within that broad problem, there are more serious problems as well. And in particular, I want to emphasize the problem of access uh, to communities uh, that are desperately in need of humanitarian assistance. Cities like Homs, Damascus itself, Deir Azor in eastern Syria, which I think is often forgotten, um, and also Aleppo, where there's been very intense fighting. Um, in all of these places and others, Regime forces have blocked access 
uh, by Syrian uh, implementers and international organizations trying to deliver vitally needed humanitarian supplies, both food and medical supplies, medical, um, even in some cases, trying to get people out of these um, fighting zones so that they can receive medical treatment elsewhere. Um, I believe eight uh, members of the United Nations team have been killed um, in humanitarian assistance missions, as well as many members of the Syrian uh, Arab Red Crescent. This is quite unacceptable. And Kofi Annan, uh, who was the Joint Special Representative for the United Nations uh, and the Arab League, um, had a specific point in his six-point plan about allowing immediate humanitarian access. And we are very unhappy uh, that the Syrian regime chose to ignore that. I would add that in the Geneva communique from June 30th, which the United States, Russia, the other permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, as well as Turkey and the Arab League, all agreed to highlighted also the importance of getting access for humanitarian assistance providers into communities that desperately need those supplies. I also have to say here, um, in our discussions with the opposition, um, we have highlighted that it is also incumbent on armed opposition groups not to block access for humanitarian assistance. It is unacceptable for either side of this conflict to block that access. Uh, there is no excuse for it. The humanitarian access and the humanitarian situation in general is, uh, as I mentioned, critical. We have seen a real interest in this in the Syrian opposition, which has begun to unify its ranks in a new and different way, and a better way. Um, I was at the meetings in Doha uh, two weeks ago where the Syrian opposition coalition uh, was established. And their leaders have made clear to us and to other members of the international community that humanitarian assistance is an urgent priority for the Syrian opposition now. Um, it is urgent enough that a very dynamic woman named Soher el Atasi, who is a real um, fighter for human rights and for liberties inside Syria, she's a very brave woman, um, and she is one of the vice presidents of the new opposition coalition. She has uh, been made sort of the lead person within the Syrian opposition um, to work on this issue. Um, I believe Kelly and Mark were just meeting with Suhair and uh, other colleagues from a working group that the opposition coalition has stood up um, to address urgently getting more humanitarian assistance into Syria. And I, they just came back last night, so I'm actually looking forward to their, to their readouts myself. We had a, a meeting with Suhair and her colleagues in London 10 days ago, and we just finished meetings in Cairo. But I want to emphasize that we want to work with the Syrian Opposition Coalition. We think it is important that they get organized themselves, working with the local administration councils that are being set up in areas where Syrian government control has receded, working with those councils on the ground um, and with the Syrian Opposition Coalition. Uh, we hope to uh, facilitate more deliveries of humanitarian assistance into Syria. Lastly, in about two weeks, we expect to have a meeting of the Friends of the Syrian People. Uh, this will bring together dozens and dozens of foreign governments at a very senior level, usually at the level of a uh, foreign minister. And I expect humanitarian assistance uh, will be an urgent item on the agenda for that meeting. The United Nations has done an excellent job collating needs and acting as a kind of a clearinghouse of information on what is needed. And it is clear from their assessments that much more assistance from the international community will be needed. The United States already has provided about $197 million in uh, humanitarian assistance to the Syrian people. Um, the implementers are actually sitting right there with us, Kelly and Mark. Um, and they can go into great detail in how we're using that money, both to help the refugees outside of Syria 
and also to get assistance into Syria to help with the communities and the in internally displaced people there. But it is an urgent priority for us working on Syria at the Department of State and in the administration. Um, we will continue to press for access. We will continue to urge other countries to join with us to provide more assistance, more humanitarian assistance. Um, and ultimately, we must insist that Bashar al-Assad step aside and that a political transition go forward that will allow Assyria at peace uh, to begin to rebuild. Let me stop there. And uh, again, Arthur and Deborah, thank you for this invitation this morning. Thank you. IRD has a lot going on in the region and as regards Syria. And I want to start this presentation, I want to organize this presentation by first giving you kind of a brief introduction to some of the stuff we're doing, to give you some context, and then move on to some of the issues that we're hearing, which will feed off of what Ambassador Ford was saying, and also provide a little bit more context for what you will hear from Mark and Kelly later on. Um, we do have a lot going on, so I will ask my colleagues in the audience if I overlook something or there's something you think that's important to add, feel free to jump in either now or maybe later during the, introduction, during the question and answer session. So that said, for example, we're working in Jordan. We have a project that works with communities in Jordan that have accepted or, or uh, have uh, accepted Iraqi refugees over the last few years. That project has been expanded now to include Syrian refugees who are moving into the communities. And what we do with them is we work with the communities to identify some of the issues that are being confronted by these towns, communities, etc. Uh, for example, uh, one town, a mayor identified trash was a serious issue. So we arranged to get 116 garbage bins brought into that town. Same mayor identified uh, pest control as an issue, so we brought in pesticide and two state-of-the-art fogging machines. In another town, uh, water filters and water tanks were a big issue. So we arranged to have those installed in some of the neediest locations. We also have a program in Iraq, which has visited the camps in the north that Ambassador Ford referred to. Um, I actually just heard a few days ago that a former IRD staffer is the Iraqi representative to the camp. Uh, in Lebanon, we work with a large network of IT professionals who have connections all across the region with these kinds of digital activists and others who are using new technologies to get the word out and to do advocacy, etc. Uh, we are also deploying a rapid response team or have deployed a rapid response team to the region. My colleague Michael will be heading out in a few days to join this team. And finally, we have a platform that we have called CMOR, the Common Monitoring and Reporting System. And what this is, there's two ways to describe this. Um, it's a little bit like iReporter. We have people in the region who have smartphones, and we've created a data template that they can use to take photos, to take audio, to take video, and then they can relay to us simultaneously what they see and what they're doing. Another way to describe this, some of you know this app called Fix My Street, where if you see a pothole, a tree down, wires down, et cetera, you take a picture of it, send it to a central database, and the local government can respond the next day and fix your street. This is something similar to what we're doing with Seymour. It's a program that was started in Afghanistan with support from the World Bank. Um, we're now doing it in Yemen, and we hope to expand it in the region as well, throughout the Middle East. Um, and why this is important, I will get to in a few minutes. So some of the issues that we're seeing. In Jordan, uh, an obvious one is uh, some of the tensions that are growing between some of the host communities and the refugees who have come in. Another one, food vouchers, access to health care and education. Uh, more quick impact projects are needed, a type of which I referred to earlier. Uh, I actually was just reading on Twitter this morning, uh, UNHCR and Human Rights Watch have reported more people have crossed the border, uh, have entered Zatari camp, um, and also Human Rights Watch was reporting that children are being recruited, I'm not sure how strongly I should use that word, out of some of these camps, including Zatari, to go back in and fight. Um, so that raises a lot of protection challenges, a lot of human rights issues uh, that have to be addressed in Jordan. In Iraq, when our staff visited this, the camps, um, 
some issues that immediately sprung up or were very visible right away. Uh, food, sanitation, lights. There was no streets, nothing was paved within the camp itself, no lights were up, and that also raises issues about safety, security for people in that camp. Turkey, the big issue we're hearing about in Turkey is registration. A lot of organizations are having trouble registering, or at least it's taking a little bit longer that's necessary to respond in time for some of the crises. In Syria on the ground, and I'm sure Mark and Kelly will speak a little bit more about this, but what we're hearing about um, from, cont from contacts and from others, commodities are still available, though prices are much higher now. There are some shortages in hotspots, some of the conflict areas, including fuel shortages. Sometimes the issue is not so much that food is not available, but that people don't have access to it. They cannot get to the market, for example. Wheat is also available, but supplies are dwindling. Uh, I read somewhere that the price of wheat has risen about 11%, but I'm not sure over what time period. That's something I need to double check about, or maybe Mark or Kelly might know that. Um, as a result, people in Site Syria are using what's called negative coping strategies. Uh, cutting back the number of meals, pulling children out of schools and putting them to work, cutting back on medical equipment, uh, medical or other expenses, et cetera. Another problem um, that we're hearing a lot about, and I suspect Mark or Kelly will talk about this as well, is differing opinions about the number of IDPs within Syria. Um, as Ambassador Ford pointed out, that number is growing quickly, and it's obviously a hard number to pin down. But what you do see is some people saying 1.2, 1.5, there have been some estimates much higher than that. Uh, Dr. Shah himself in Turkey a few days ago uh, did say that there was a shortfall in the number of people receiving assistance, meaning that assistance is being provided for 1.5 million people right now, but it's becoming clear that's not enough. Uh, Dr. Shaw also said there is an immediate humanitarian emergency. Some other issues. Some of you who I've had the pleasure of working with in other places will certainly appreciate some of this. Uh, when it comes time to a transition, should it get to that level, whether it be on the national level or local level as different towns are brought under control of the opposition or the Free Syria Army, there's a range of issues that need to be addressed and are being addressed, but a lot more attention needs to be brought to those. Uh, first amongst those is providing security and protection. Revenge is a big one that will happen and is already happening, but being able to establish some type of security protocol where people feel safe and comfortable will be huge. So will rule of law. Governance issues, which constitution should be used? How do you tap into some of the local committees that have been very strong albeit some have also been very weak in the last few months of the situation. But how do you tap into some of the local level activism that's happening? Creating a sustainable economy, and perhaps also as pressing, establishing social well-being, as my colleague Daniel Sorber likes to say, um, social issues, establishing rights for women. Winter's coming, how do you prepare for the humanitarian issues that are going to arise from this? Uh, as Daniel himself says, it won't be a picnic when it comes time to dealing with some of these issues. Um, kind of in conclusion, I want to wrap up a few of these strands here. Um, the immediate humanitarian disaster must obviously be attended to, but it cannot be at the presence of preparing for what's next. Um, those people who have worked in other places know that you have to prepare, 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 and then you have to be ready for when your plan meets reality and you have to be flexible and be able to respond accordingly. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. So after, how these going? After Albert's got all the problems, now we'll leave it to AID yeah, to great. resolve them. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning and uh, thanks for inviting me to speak today. As Ambassador Ford said, the humanitarian situation in Syria is continuing to deteriorate. And it is a, a truly tragic situation with the numbers affected. Uh, the numbers today uh, of people who have been displaced from their homes are 1.2 million is the official number. But we actually think that number is much higher. And I'm going to get into a little bit later about the importance of data in this crisis. Uh, what I'm going to really focus on today, though, is what is, has been, I believe, truly an untold story. And that's what the U.S. government has done in response to this crisis. 
Over the last uh, several months, really, I've seen a number of articles in, in major papers that are describing situations inside Syria, whether in internally displaced people's camps or in communities where no aid is getting in. That's simply not the case. To date, the U.S. government has provided nearly $200 million in humanitarian assistance to the region. Of that, $122 million has gone inside of Syria. And uh, Kelly's organization, PRM, and OFDA, Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and the Office of Food for Peace, have been working around the clock since this crisis started to get in aid. Now, agree, uh, admittedly, one of the reasons this may not be a, a well-told story is that we've been pretty quiet about it. It's been incredibly dangerous to do these kinds of operations inside. But we've been funding a number of truly heroic partners for months now who've been able to access every area of Syria. We're working in all 14 governments. We're working in the conflict areas. We're working in opposition areas. Are we getting enough aid in? The answer to that, sadly, is no. But are we getting a considerable amount of aid in? Yes. And let me just give you a little bit of detail on that. And it also, as I go through this, I'll be describing our prioritization in terms of, of how we're uh, focusing on what sectors. And the first priority is clearly medical assistance, especially in the conflict areas. Uh, the amount of people that have been seriously wounded, uh, we don't have an accurate number, but it's clearly very, very high. And to date, our efforts have provided medical assistance to 667,000 Syrians inside Syria. And what does that mean? That's everything from training medical professionals, because a lot of doctors have fled or been killed. Medical facilities, personnel have been deliberately targeted by the regime uh, in this war. And so we've trained over 500 medical professionals who've been able to go into Syria to provide medical assistance. We're bringing significant quantities of medical supplies into Syria, and that's everything from trauma kits to advanced surgical kits to uh, mobile x-ray machines. Uh, just the other, recently I heard a story of a young 10-year-old girl who was displaced from her family in fighting and was seriously in, injured in shelling. And our partners were able to provide life-saving surgery and we're seeing that happen day to day throughout conflict areas in Syria. But in addition to this, this urgent care, and, and to date I'd say our, our assistance has provided uh, the medical equipment for over 24,000 uh, surgeries inside Syria. But in addition to these urgent needs, there are primary health care needs as this conflict winds on. There are vaccination problems, especially with children. Uh, there's people who have cancer or other chronic diseases who aren't getting drugs. One of the major manufacturing areas in Aleppo for drug production in Syria has been significantly damaged through attacks by the regime. So we're looking at trying to address those issues as well. And another issue that we're very focused on today is winterization. Um, people who are displaced, they become far more vulnerable to all types of problems. And so trying to keep people warm. We know that, I mentioned the numbers of displacement, which are huge. Uh, many of those people have fled into public buildings and buildings that have been damaged. So we're looking at ways to make those buildings more habitable. We're bringing in mattresses, we're bringing in kitchen sets, other non-food items for people who've been uh, driven from their homes. Uh, clothing, of course. Uh, blankets, heating elements, and to date we've reached 340,000 people, many of these in conflict areas inside Syria, and we're hoping to double that in just the next uh, month to two months during the midst of winter. So there's a lot going on on that front. And food aid, I mentioned the Office of Food for Peace. Uh, between Food for Peace, uh, their implementing partner World Food Program, and uh, ICRC that, that PRM can talk about, we've reached well over a million and a half people in Syria with food aid. So there's significant efforts going on that. Wash, water and sanitation, another critical element is people are displaced, because we know they'll, they'll be subject to, to dirty water and disease, so we're providing clean water, sanitation. Uh, and then I don't want to leave out, certainly, child protection issues uh, and sexual and gender-based violence, which is a real problem right now in terms of violence against women in Syria and rape. Uh, we're doing programming in that area. Not as much as we'd like to, but we're, we're ramping up, especially we're, we're hoping to do more in these conflict areas. Children are particularly traumatized in situations like this, and we have good experience from decades of doing this work of programs that can help them. So we're, we're very focused on that. And I don't want to go on too long, so let me just wrap up with the issue I mentioned about data. I think that, frankly, is one of our biggest problems today, is data. Um, as much as the U.S. has done, no one single donor can handle this crisis given its scale. And Kelly and I and others have been traveling uh, ceaselessly uh, to try to work with, with other countries, other donors. I was in 
Istanbul uh, three days ago uh, with a, a meeting with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. USAID has a, a memorandum of understanding with them. And we're working with them. They're doing quite a bit, Gulf nations inside Syria as well. We're trying to better understand what they're doing, they understand what we're doing, so that we're not duplicating aid, so that we're hitting those areas that aren't getting enough aid. And data collection is particularly difficult in these uh, conflict areas. And that's something that we're trying to focus on, because we think the needs are frankly grossly understated in these areas. And the UN appeal, uh, to date the U.S. has provided inside Syria uh, some $81 million for the inside Syria appeal, uh, which is a significant, it's, it's by far and away the largest donor, but a lot of our funding is going outside the appeal because we're using these very uh, innovative ways to reach these, these populations that are most in need. But clearly more needs to be done on the international front uh, to, to fund the UN appeals and to fund these other areas, other methods, to get to these people who are, who are in such need. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to Deborah, Middle East Institute, and Art from IRD. Appreciate very much the invitation to be with you and join you this morning. Uh, my comments are going to uh, build very much on, on Albert, Mark, and Ambassador Ford's comments on the overall situation, but let me focus primarily on the refugee situation. We can get into other details in the Q&A section of this event. So it's a little, it's easy to get dazzled by numbers, you know, in terms of the growing numbers and, and in terms of many of us have been throwing out, you know, what the internally displaced figures are, rapidly rising, 1.2 to 2.5 million. The refugee numbers uh, now exceeding 450,000. Ambassador Ford gave you a good comparison of what we were dealing with a year ago, considerably lower. But these are all, there are people behind each of these numbers. And so that is very much a focus in terms of whether or not it's our, our humanitarian diplomacy on the international stage in terms of what the United States government is trying to do, or in terms of the programming that we're doing at a very practical and concrete grassroots level, whether or not inside Syria or in the neighboring countries. On the refugee situation, it's a very different scene, depending upon which context you're talking about. And I'll talk about why Mark and I were in Cairo uh, just the last couple of days in a, in a bit. Uh, we've been focusing primarily on the four neighbors, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey. But let's not also forget that refugees are also now fleeing to North Africa and Egypt was a very good example of this. Um, and we spent some time talking with, with the Egyptian government in the context of the meeting we were at with the Syrian Opposition Coalition's Assistance Coordination Unit in terms of what Egypt is doing for, you know, you can, again, numbers don't tell the story. It's the people behind the numbers that we need to focus on. In terms of Egypt, we have just shy of 10,000 who have been registered, but there are some 100 to 150,000 Syrians that have gone to Egypt since this crisis began uh, some 20, 21 months ago. That is a huge tribute to what the government of Egypt has done in terms of being able to receive individuals, to be able to support them, provide some flexibility in terms of how long they can stay in the country, uh, put their kids in school, access medical facilities. That kind of generosity is mirrored in the other closer neighbors, you know, whether or not we're talking about Jordan, uh, that is now looking at a, an official refugee population of 140,000, and I'll get to the unofficial numbers here in a minute, or Turkey of 125,000 individuals, Lebanon 135,000, and now Iraq at 60,000. And that's not to mention the some 40 to 50,000 Iraqi refugees that have gone from uh, Syria back to Iraq, perhaps a little earlier than they intended. So there are numbers of stories here within stories. In each of the contexts, they're quite different. Obviously in Jordan, the vast majority of Syrians are outside camps, although I have to say in terms of the attention, whether or not it's from the media, um, frankly ourselves, uh, a lot of focus on the Zatri camp there are uh, far greater numbers that are outside of that camp, some 110,000 to 120,000, being assisted and supported by very generous Jordan communities that are facing a tremendous burden in terms of being able to support these individuals. 
Despite that, Jordan has allowed these folks uh, to put their kids in school, to access medical facilities, and certainly with great support uh, from the international community led by the United States, uh, to be able to focus on all kinds of areas of, of assistance, whether or not we're talking about protection or just basic uh, shelter, uh, livelihood support, uh, water, sanitation, etc., which is important. In Turkey, it's an entirely different situation. There are 14 camps that have been established by the government of Turkey and run by the uh, uh, Turkish Red Crescent called Kisalai. They provide everything from hot meals uh, to education, health clinics. Uh, the standards of humanitarian assistance in these camps are way above uh, normal uh, humanitarian standards used anywhere else in the world in terms of refugee uh, reception. And it's quite a tribute to what the Turkish government has done, and that generosity continues to today. In Lebanon, no camps to speak of. This is entirely a community that has supported the 135,000 in communities, in community shelters, uh, in, in neighborhood schools, etc. Entirely uh, a non-camp based population. And in Iraq, we have a mix, as Ambassador Ford said, between a couple of camps that have been established, but again, the majority of the refugees have been received in host communities. Now, in terms of these various contexts of support, and we're not in a position of saying what's right, what's not right. There are pros and cons to, to camp situations. We can get into that a little bit in the Q&A. It's very clear whether or not we're talking about support from the international community through the big organizations that we support, or the support that those host governments are providing each day to those ref refugees, that funding is a key concern in terms of going forward. We are not preparing for a situation that will be over tomorrow. This is a situation that will be, unfortunately, with us for months and, and perhaps years to come in terms of whether or not you're talking about sustaining refugee populations or supporting them to be able to return, we hope, someday. Uh, soon to Syria. All of that will require tremendous support. But as Mark mentioned, we are by far the largest bilateral donor to this situation, and we need others to come forward, whether or not that's traditional donors or non-traditional donors, in terms of doing more. And that's more both through the UN appeals that Mark mentioned, the Syrian Humanitarian Response Plan, or the neighboring countries plan, the rapid, the, the excuse me, refugee response plan, the RRP. There are two different funding mechanisms. For the Inside Syria appeal, Mark mentioned again that we're, we're the largest uh, donor to that. However, it is still just uh, a little above 50 percent funded. And this is only until the end of next month, until the end of December. We expect that this appeal will be relaunched in the middle of December for the first half of 2013 with needs potentially to double in terms of what donors will be asked to support. This is something we intend to support ourselves, but again, we need many others with us. Uh, in terms of the refugee response plan, it's not as well funded. It's less than 50 percent, probably closer to 40 percent funded. And again, this is a plan that, that expires at the end of next month, and the needs will likely double going forward in terms of the first half of 2013. So what are our priorities? Uh, they are very similar outside the country as to inside the country, although obviously we don't have the same problems and constraints related to access that Ambassador Ford and Mark both mentioned. Uh, winterization has been a huge priority for the United States government. We know that UNHCR issued uh, an appeal some weeks ago for $64 million from the international community. Uh, we made an announcement in Geneva in the middle of November that supported half of UNHCR's requirements in places like Jordan, Lebanon, Turkey, uh, and Iraq. And that kind of support needs to continue. It's not winter is upon us, winter is here. Uh, and there's a tremendous amount of need, and that need continues uh, to grow. So I mentioned what I would call the invisible non-camp population. And this is something that we have had a huge focus on, and I would say this is not an order of priority, but one of our, our key priorities. We don't want to focus just on the camps. We want to be sure that host communities are also supported. And this goes from everything from making sure that those host family, families have safe uh, heating units, uh, blankets, ways to be able to support the Syrian families staying with them, 
uh, medical needs, etc. And that's been a huge uh, priority for us. You know, if you look at the, the figures between camps and non-camp populations, just a quick calculation uh, would lead to about 340,000 of what we're looking at now in terms of not being in camps. So for example, in Jordan, in addition to that figure I gave you earlier of 140,000, there's an estimated 110,000 that are not in camps. In Turkey, 70,000 on top of 125,000 that are currently in camps living in Turkish communities trying to make the best of a very des desperate situation. And in Iraq, an additional 25,000 on top of 60,000. So the invisible non-camp population is certainly a priority for the United States government. Third issue to mention is registration. In places like Egypt, although I gave you a huge range between this less than 10,000 registered and 100 to 150,000 in Egypt, there is not a backlog on registration, but yet that hasn't stopped the international community through the UN High Commissioner for Refugees from doing things like mobile registration clinics and trying to make sure that they are as accessible as possible as the numbers of those in Egypt who want to avail themselves of international assistance can register. The situation is a little more grim in places like Jordan and Lebanon, and the backlogs are serious in terms of the registration. In Lebanon, the conflict around Tripoli uh, basically stopped UNHCR's programs for some uh, days and even weeks in terms of being able to register. So we are pushing and urging the international system, primarily UNHCR, to work with the governments to redouble efforts to register because that's a key aspect of identifying those in need of assistance. Protection. I mention it fourth. It is not the fourth priority. It's one of our top priorities. Each of these governments have been very generous in terms of keeping their borders open. This is probably our number one um, ask of those governments when we talk to them. And they have reassured us that they want to keep these borders open. Obviously, there are concerns as numbers grow as to the sustainability of the assistance inside the countries in the neighbors, and that's why we want that to continue. But open borders, tremendously important. Related to that, the, a French term called non refoulement which is those that are seeking asylum in the neighbors not be sent back to Syria. This is something that has certainly been part of our um, diplomatic message and we have worked very closely with the governments to, in, to ensure that that doesn't happen. Other protection concerns, again, mirror what Mark mentioned inside Syria. Gender-based violence, very concerned about, looking at programming to support. Um, children, in terms of their particular needs, psychosocial support and the like, uh, key concern. And then the very delicate nature of those refugee populations inside Syria that are under stress and strain. And in this, in this regard, I might mention the 450,000 to 500,000 Palestinian refugees that have been in Syria for decades. And certainly the support we're providing to UNRWA inside Syria has managed to be able to anchor them for the time being. Um, the last thing I might mention in terms of uh, priorities is obviously contingency planning. And that's something that we, on a regular basis in any crisis, try to do a whole lot of. Uh, I think the numbers that we'll see from the UN when they come out with revised appeals next month will reflect considerably higher needs. Not that we're expecting all of that to happen, but we certainly want to make sure that we're ready for it. Um, finally, let me just mention a, uh, a comment about Cairo and the meeting that Mark and I just attended with the Assistance Coordination Unit of the Syrian uh, Opposition Coalition. It was very clear that this group of very dedicated individuals uh, we're very interested in trying to increase the amount of humanitarian assistance going into Syria, and they were very focused on the needs. They were very focused on how to provide this assistance to all Syrians. They were very focused on humanitarian principles. These were certainly uh, good messages for us to hear and to help to reinforce. We were trying very much to see how we could better support their efforts try to link them up with the broader uh, humanitarian assistance framework that has been established and is ongoing and we're trying to expand. They identified three primary uh, priorities which mirror certainly our own. That is winter, food relief, and acute medical needs. And these are things that I think we'll be looking towards in the coming weeks and days in terms of how we can better support those efforts. So let me stop there and we'll be happy to take your questions later. 
Well, first, let me just say thank you to all of our the, the panelists. I think this has been, a, in, in short time, a great overview of what is obviously an extraordinarily complex and challenging uh, situation, particularly given the political and the military dimensions of the problem uh, still. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions now. Let me just say that um, Ambassador Ford does have to leave at 10.15. The other panelists will stay later on. Uh, so if you feel the great urge to uh, offer policy prescriptions in lieu of questions, please disguise them cleverly as brief questions so that we can start with that. And I am going to start as a courtesy with our, uh, with our press here, and most of them are sitting in a bullpen, I can see over on this side. Uh, and so uh, let me start, I mean, I'm going to come over here and take three. Barbara, we'll start with you, and I think we'll go back and back and then uh, here. And go ahead. And our staff is here. And please do turn off your cell phones. If you can't figure it out, we have young staff from MEI who will help you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Deborah. Thank you to all of you. Uh, Ambassador Ford, um, Barbara Slavin from uh, the Atlantic Council, Council and I'll monitor.com. Uh, France, Britain, the GCC, Turkey have all formally recognized this new council. Uh, why hasn't the U.S.? Do you anticipate that's going to change in the near future? What, what line do they have to cross? What T do they have to cross or, or I to dot? And if I could also add on, uh, the Patriot missiles that are going to be deployed, what is their purpose in Turkey beyond protecting Turkey? Thank you. Next, let's take three and then we'll, that's for Ambassador Ford. And if you have it directed, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. No. Jonathan, you're after. And actually, there's three others. But we can go ahead with four from the press as long as you can remember them. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Karen DeYoung from the Washington Post. Just a quick question. There are reports this morning that the Syrian government has disconnected the internet there, uh, similar to what happened in, in Egypt some time ago. Um, could you uh, comment on what that will do, would do, to your efforts uh, inside Syria? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's Ilhan Tuner from Turkish Press. Actually, it's going to be similar to uh, what already asked, but uh, according to today's uh, time story, uh, U.S. Uh, is going to be more ac actively engaged with Syria. Apparently, whatever the U.S. has been doing so far uh, is not working, and uh, everything the U.S. said it shouldn't happen, it just happened. Uh, radical elements and a more displaced people and more uh, we can go on. I just want to ask whether this story in the uh, Times has any legs. Thank you. I think you're referring to the U.S. deciding to perhaps get more involved in distribution of weapons or it's to track them. I think that was the point. Okay, sorry. Jonathan, would you want to, and then that's four and we'll stop there and start the answering. Back staff with, the, and then we'll go to this side. But, Jonathan, you want to stand up and we'll restate. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, the, the Europeans have talked about. That's right. No problem. The Europeans have talked about reconsidering their arms embargo in order to supply weapons to the opposition. The United States argues that they don't want to do that because you you don't know who might be getting the weapons and you might be making the situation worse. But in doing so, isn't the United States risking allowing? the groups that it doesn't want to be preeminent in the opposition, the sophists, uh, to maintain their preeminence and, in fact, advance. And does that not cost the United States, at the end, influence in a post-Assad Syria? Robert. Okay, someone take your reminder. And you want us to take the podium for these. And does anyone else want to respond to any of those? We'll leave those to the State Department, except Robert in the hot seat. This is something great. Um, well, first, thank you for those questions. I'm, I'm, no, seriously. I, Syria is a huge, huge human catastrophe. It is a tragedy. And um, that's why I was glad to come today to talk about this. Um, so quick, go through them. Um, on the Syrian opposition coalition and our stance, I want to be very clear. We strongly, strongly, strongly support the efforts of the Syrian opposition coalition to develop its organization. Uh, Kelly mentioned uh, the work that their assistance coordination unit is doing. 
Uh, we sent a very capable team with senior officials that are here with us today to work with them. We think they are absolutely, I'll even say it in Arabic if we have Arabic press here, Bekul Te'akid. They are a legitimate representative of the Syrian people's aspirations. And we will work with them. We will cooperate with them. They have a vision of Syria in the future that we strongly support, a country that it would be democratic, that would respect human rights, and that would be a force for stability in the region. We would like to see them continue to develop as an organization, as a coalition. They are making real progress, and I expect that our position with them will evolve as they themselves develop. But I want to be very clear that we welcome the establishment of the coalition and that we will work with them. With respect to the Patriots, Turkey, as is its right, as a member of the NATO alliance, and as a country which has had casualties, Turkish citizens have been killed because of fighting in Syria. I want to say that again. Turkish citizens have been killed because of shelling coming from inside Syria. They have a right to ask for defense assistance through NATO. They are making that request, and we are supportive. The mission is to support the defense of Turkey. With respect to the internet, this is a great question. Um, first of all, restrictions on Syrian internet access are not new. The Syrian government has been monitoring it for years. They have been uh, using the internet with Iranian assistance to track opposition activists, arrest and kill them. That is the reason why in our non-lethal assistance to the Syrian opposition, we put a special emphasis on communications equipment, precisely to help the Syrian people tell the world what is going on inside Syria. We do not want a repeat of the 1982 massacre of tens of thousands of people in the city of Hama. The Syrian government in 1982, Bashar's father, Hafez, shut down all communications and the world never got a clear picture of what happened in Hama. I visited Syria a year after that as a tourist, I was a young tourist, and even then the Syrians were wondering what exactly had happened in Hama. We do not want a repeat of that. A lot of the pictures that you see on the nightly news are from communications equipment that we supplied to very brave and to very dedicated opposition activists inside Syria. We have provided over a thousand pieces of non-lethal equipment, largely communications gear, to help them get around the restrictions on the internet which the Syrian government has imposed. Um, with respect to being more actively engaged, we are very actively engaged. We are very actively engaged. We have talked about the work that the United States has done, the largest single bilateral donor on humanitarian assistance. Let me say that again. The United States is the largest single assistance donor in this humanitarian crisis. Not every box has an American flag on it. Not every box has a handshake gift from the United States people. There are lots of political sensitivities involved in here, but American supplies are getting through to field hospitals. American supplies are getting through to help children survive what is going to be a terrible winter. I mean, the situation with the winter coming is going to be extremely hard. Um, we are actively engaged on humanitarian assistance. We have worked very hard with other countries, friends of Syria, to impose a very tough sanctions uh, regime on the Syrian government. There is a meeting that opens in Tokyo. It's, in fact, it's underway today in Tokyo. Um, on financial sanctions, we have introduced additional individuals from the Syrian government onto our sanctions list. Uh, we are encouraging other countries to take actions to stop money flows into the Syrian financial system. This is the same system 
that bank rolls their security services as the same financial system that is buying weapons and getting weapons. We are working very hard on that front. With respect to the question of arms, which I think a lot of people equate action with arms, and I have to say that is a mistake. Arms are not a strategy. Arms are a tactic. Let me say that again. Arms are a tactic. We do not think, I say this very clearly, we think that a military solution is not the best way for Syria. Um, efforts to win this by conquering one side or the other will simply prolong the violence and frankly aggravate an already terrible humanitarian situation. Syria needs a political solution. The good news is that the Syrian opposition itself, Syrian opposition itself, at the beginning of July, last summer, issued a transition plan. How many of you have read it? A few, that's good. I recommend it to everyone. That transition plan itself, written by the Syrian opposition, many of the people who are in this new opposition coalition, including people like Rima Flihan, helped draft that transition plan. The transition plan itself calls for the establishment of a transition government and the participation of people from the opposition and others in Syria who do not have blood on their hands. That is to be accomplished through an agreement on all sides. It is a political vision. And it then carries forward to redrafting the Constitution and going to elections. The question then about arms becomes, do arms help achieve that political solution or do they make it harder? Will providing arms to the opposition convince the people who support Bashar al-Assad, in many cases because they are afraid of their own existence, or will it simply lead to more fighting? That is the question that we are considering. The president has never taken provision of arms off the table. And we have always acknowledged, A, that this uprising in Syria started as a peaceful protest movement. I myself went and saw how peaceful it was when I went to Hama in 2011. That it was the Syrian government's violence and brutal repression that stirred the fighting that we see now. And finally, we certainly understand the Syrian people's desire to defend themselves. But when we talk about arms, we do not want arms to get in the hands of extremists. There absolutely are extremists fighting in Syria now. In fact, there was fighting between extremists and Kurdish fighters in the north of the country two weeks ago, and that continued into the beginning of this week. There is an Al-Qaeda front in Syria. It's called Jabhat al-Nusra. I do not think it is by any means the majority of the armed opposition. I think many of the armed opposition leaders have done a good job trying to reach out to people in the Alawi and Christian communities. They are to be commended for that. But the Jabhat al-Nusra and other extremists pose a real danger to the political solution that Syria needs. And so, as we think about our policy of sending arms or not, and today we do not, we want to make sure that that tactic plays into and helps us achieve the strategy of enabling the Syrian people to reach a political solution. Thanks. Can I add a quick sentence to the internet question? Um, you reminded me, I mentioned our Seymour platform for collecting data, but I neglected to get back to it. Uh, this platform actually works with or without internet. Uh, and it provides people to provide real-time reporting on what's happening. Um, we've been able to set up a reporting sheet that can include infrastructure, wash sand issues, uh, even perceptions data. People can report to us what people are saying, seeing um, what's happening on the streets, any number of things. And uh, for example, uh, when electricity goes out in a town, we're able to find out about it almost simultaneously through this platform. And I think what you're seeing is, well, absolutely what you're seeing is this transformation about how data is collected and how it's used. Obviously, the data is only useful if it's actually followed up on and used, but you do see some of that. Obviously, cutting off the internet will have implications if it is indeed true. Though, as the ambassador mentioned, that's, you know, that's one of the big issues, but organizations like IRD, USAID, and others are responding in kind. Okay. 
let me go to this side. We'll just take three to begin with. Um, okay, here first, there second. Sorry, and excuse me for pointing because I don't know your names and you in the blue shirt, unshaven. Okay, so we'll start. Where were the women? You had three women before you stopped. But anyway, go ahead. Uh, for the ambassador, um, hello, my name is Taylor Rose from World Net Daily. Um, quick question for you. Yesterday in Damascus, a uh, suicide bomb went off in a predominantly Christian neighborhood that was considered loyal to Assad. Um, and it was, the attack was commenced by the uh, opposition forces. And I was just wanting to ask you, what is the United States going to do to restrain the extremist elements inside the opposition that are attacking Christians and innocent people? Um, from the opposition. We're going to take three at a time, and then we'll go three answers, and then we'll come back. And I'm, I've already got, I think, two people in the back. My name is Tamam Al-Barazi, a Syrian journalist. Mr. Ambassador, when you talk about political uh, solution, a lot of Syrians are afraid of this uh, political uh, uh, solution because they think that the regime will stay, maybe Assad will uh, escape, uh, you know, uh, any, any court... Uh, you know, for his crime, but uh, or will else will end like Yemen, which you know the regime is still entrenched. The president is gone, but still the regime is entrenched. So, what do you mean by political solution? Isn't it right here in blue, the light blue shirt. Third question from this side. Then we'll have answers, and we'll take some more from the back. Um, thank you for your time. Uh, one thing that I was wondering about, as you guys spoke a lot about humanitarian assistance, which is very important, but what have we learned um, through, um, during the transitions in the other countries in, in the Arab Spring that are being used today to prepare for issues that will come up post-humanitarian assistance? Okay. That's, a, that's for the AID folks, I think, and, and PRM and the others. Okay, Robert, why don't you take the first two, and then we'll go and bunch of guys. With respect to the extremists that you, you raised, as I said, they're absolutely there. And I think, frankly, their presence is growing stronger. It is a real problem. I think it is adding to the difficulties of reaching the political solution that I, that I mentioned. We have certainly raised, in our discussions with other countries, the importance of isolating extremists and not helping them. Uh, those are conversations that continue. Um, we know a lot more about the armed groups operating inside Syria than we did a year ago, which is good. Um, and we're working with other countries to identify who exactly the worst groups are and how to isolate them. At the same time, in our own discussions with Syrian opposition, both political and armed groups, I myself have talked to the Free Syrian Army, I'm sure I will again, um, we have emphasized the importance of respecting uh, human rights, respecting the inviability of civilian targets. Um, I raised personally that uh, video of the Syrian soldiers who were summarily executed in Sarakat. I uh, raised that personally with the Free Syrian Army and said that kind of thing is unacceptable. Um, it is a, it's, this is a civil war, however, and one or two or three conversations does not fix the problem. We have got to get people to understand that ultimately there is no way out but a political solution that will involve national reconciliation. The opposition plan which the Syrian opposition itself developed and announced in Cairo last July has an element on that and I think that is a positive, positive development. Um, the gentleman asked about what do we mean by political solution and it really is very simple. The opposition plan that the uh, call on the transition is a step-by-step -step plan. It has about six, seven steps. They look very reasonable to us, and we support that plan. We support that vision that they developed. Um, it involves going from a caretaker government post Bashar al-Assad to the establishment of a transition government after the holding of a broad national conference to then uh, the transition government itself overseeing a process of redrafting the constitution and submitting the new constitution to a referendum and then to elections 
That is what is in the opposition's transition plan. I would then call your attention to the Geneva communique agreed to by the United States, Russia, the other permanent members of the Security Council, Turkey and the Arab League. And if you read that, you will see that it is exactly the same roadmap. And so that is what we mean by political transition. Bashar al-Assad, we have said since August of 2011 when it was very clear that he was not interested in a political solution after he had sent more forces into Deir ez-Zor and Hama and Dara, we said he must step aside. He must step aside, him and his clique, and there must be a political transition that is allowed to go forward. So, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna ask Robert, I'm gonna ask Ambassador Ford to stay here. We'll take that a longer question since you have more time here because I have a feeling that there are three questions in the back. I'm gonna go with the woman in the back who's standing with the coat and the gentleman in the red tie, the press I can't see because of the Klieg lights and there's two other press right there. And so let's go in with the two gentlemen, the woman in the back and the black. And then, then those will, I assume, be for Ambassador Ford. Then we'll move to the other issues here. Robert. Ambassador Ford, thank you very much. Sean Maroney, Voice of America, in front of the light. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, we can't see you back there. Sorry. Um, in terms of shoulder-mounted rockets that, that have been introduced into the conflict, I'm curious what your uh, response would be to certain elements who would say that these are the equalizer for the opposition uh, as the Assad government, one of its major uh, uh, successes against the opposition have been the superiority in the air, as we saw in the 1980s with Mujahideen against the Soviets, they actually, uh, these types of weapons helped bring a, an end to that. Uh, and, and in terms of the res uh, reports that there are state actors who have been providing this assistance to the opposition, what if any pressure has the United States been uh, doing uh, in regards to them providing these sorts of weapons? Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Jonathan Blakely from National Public Radio. A um, couple questions about aid for the ambassador. Um, if you can, again, elaborate a bit on the difficulties, success, the successes and difficulties of getting aid to the camps in, and this is for everyone actually, to the aid and to the camps inside Syria. Um, are you able to get aid uh, to local governments that have formed inside Syria? And how are you monitoring the aid uh, overall. And, and again, the internet question, that's more of a today question. Apparently that's happened today where a New Hampshire company that monitors internet says that the 84 uh, IP blocks that's for Syria have been knocked out. So this is more of a, I know the Assad government has been monitoring the internet prior to now, but today's development is newer. It sounds as if the entire internet's been knocked out for Syria. I don't know if, can you confirm that or what do you know about that? Okay, and one last question, the woman in the back, stand and then sure. Hi, I'm um, Jay Newton-Small with Time Magazine. I just wanted to ask, um, can you imagine a time in the near future where we would provide arms to Syria and what that might look like? And uh, also any lessons that have been drawn in the U.S. experience in Libya, uh, particularly with arms after the conflict has ended? Um. I'm going to let Mark and uh, uh, Kelly talk a little bit about the aid questions uh, that you answered um, and uh, access and such things. Um, with respect to the shoulder-mounted uh, rockets and whether or not they're an equalizer, I have a couple of things to say about that. First, uh, the regime's use of uh, jets to strike purely civilian targets is absolutely reprehensible. Um, I mentioned the repeated strikes on Syrian medical facilities, such as the hospital in Aleppo, but many hospitals have been bombed. Um, you, I presume, have seen the Human Rights Report, uh, Human Rights Watch report about uh, targeting of people standing in bread lines. Um, I, this kind of use of air power, and in many cases artillery as well, um, is simply, simply outrageous. Um, is it an equalizer? Um, yeah, I think it will certainly complicate 
uh, the Syrian military's calculations in terms of how to carry on the fight. Um, and I want to be clear, the Syrian military is weakening. You can see that on the ground. They are absolutely weakening. Um, but I also think it is important to say that I don't think the mere presence of shoulder fired missiles is going to lead the people who are fighting for Bashar al-Assad to stop fighting for Bashar al-Assad. And what we are talking about here, and especially in the context of the humanitarian needs of Syria, is the need to stop the fighting so that the humanitarian crisis doesn't get worse. And instead, people who've been displaced from their homes eventually can go home and begin to rebuild. Um, I, I was intrigued, you mentioned Afghanistan. And in fact, look at the history of Afghanistan. It's certainly the presence of those rockets um, absolutely made the Russians, the Soviets' task in Afghanistan infinitely more difficult. But it didn't bring the political solution that Afghanistan needs. Um, young lady asked about Libya. And again, Libya is an example where arms are proliferate and yet it is very difficult to get the kind of stability and, and a political agreement to go forward uh, that is needed. The Libyans are making uh, huge strides, huge efforts. We support those. Uh, but the proliferation of weapons by themselves um, is not a strategy. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. We're going to let Ambassador Ford escape now. I'm sorry, but he's got a bit of pretty big agenda back at the workplace. Okay, so let's go ahead with the answers to the two of the humanitarian responses, and then we'll take three more questions, and then back to the Sure. Uh, well, let me start with the question about aid getting into camps inside Syria and how we monitor. Um, I mentioned that uh, I'd seen a number of media reports recently that uh, inaccurately said that, uh, in fact, no international assistance was getting into a particular camp, uh, when in fact it is. Uh, as Ambassador Ford said, uh, we're not, we're actually, we're not branding at all any of our aid, U.S. government aid, that's going inside Syria right now. Um, that's just due to the, the risky nature of providing assistance. So that's one thing, is people wouldn't even know necessarily that this is coming from the United States government. Uh, and we're keeping a very low profile. But uh, in fact, uh, there are a number of camps that you're probably referring to along the border in Turkey, and aid is going, they're inside Syria, in, into those camps. Um, it's not sufficient, but there's another issue there too. Um, there's been a lot of requests to, for tents and setting up more um, permanent structures, and it's the best practice in the provision of humanitarian assistance to try to keep populations away from border areas, because just historically, they're particularly vulnerable there. And so we've been encouraging some of those populations as well to move back into to hard sh shelters, which are also better to survive a winter in. Uh, but it's not been easy because they want to get into Turkey. That's why they're, what, that's why they're there. And Turkey is, and, and Kelly can talk about that, continuing to, to build camps and, and access. In terms of how we're monitoring aid, um, let me just say that we're, we're absolutely seized by this issue. We want to be accountable to, to the taxpayer dollar that we're spending to do this uh, assistance. And uh, there's a myriad types of aid going into Syria right now. I mentioned medical assistance. I think we're doing very well monitoring that because it's going directly to field hospitals, to medical personnel, and we have feedback loops in those communities to ensure that our aid is getting to where it needs to go. It gets a little more complicated when it gets to food aid. Uh, one of the primary providers of food aid is the Syrian Arab Red Crescent, and which is not by any means a monolithic organization. There are many elements of that. And uh, it is a war zone, a very complicated place to operate in. So could there be problems? I expect there will be. There's never been a response in a situation like this where there aren't problems. Uh, but we are doing a number of things from looking at receipts to, to, again, trying to get feedback from areas where this type of assistance is being delivered to ensure that it's going to where it needs to go. Uh, so, so monitoring is, is something we're definitely focused on. And then let me try to answer a couple of the other questions that were asked. And, and there was a question asked about um, essentially reprisals uh, by the opposition. And let me also say that that's an issue that we're very concerned about. And even today, as we're providing urgent humanitarian assistance, a lot of our program, especially in conflict areas, is looking at social cohesion issues. Uh, we're working with uh, Sunni populations, with Alawite populations, with Christians, every group in, inside Syria. And we're trying to work ahead and think ahead, strategize about how we can promote social cohesion. And, and fortunately, there was a lot of, of that prior to this conflict breaking out. And there's actually some very um, optimistic stories on that front. 
Nonetheless, we see this as a huge issue going forward if, if the regime, when the regime falls. So it's something that, that we're trying to focus on. Uh, and then there was a question about lessons learned from the Arab Spring writ large and uh, longer term issues. Um, our offices, we're certainly working on issues like livelihoods, uh, agricultural sector, essential services, but there's a tremendous amount of planning going on within the U.S. government right now for a post-Assad Syria. Um, and there are certainly experts looking at economic development issues, at rule of law, at governance issues. Those are really the key things, and there's been a lot of lessons coming out of the Arab Spring that they're focusing on to try to promote a Syria that works for all Syrians. Maybe just a couple of follow-ups to, to Mark's uh, answers, and I'll, I'll do it in the same order. Uh, the issues related to, um, obviously, challenges re regarding getting aid in, Ambassador Ford hit that right at the top. It's violence. It's access. It's, you know, in any particular neighborhood or situation, it varies from day to day whether or not uh, partners and agencies are actually able to get aid in, which makes, uh, obviously, it very challenging in terms of mapping exercises and the like to figure out where we've reached, where we haven't reached. But stop the violence and the aid will flow. Uh, the issues related to monitoring aid, I mean, one of the, in addition to, to some of the more informal networks that we've established to try to get aid into Syria, we are working with international organizations that we've worked with for decades. Uh, this is uh, organizations like the International Committee of the Red Cross, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, UNRWA, the World Food Program, and so on. They have very strongly uh, adapted both needs identification in terms of the people that they're trying to reach, and then the systems of accountability in terms of making sure that the aid that we're providing, again, as Mark mentioned, with, from, with the U.S. being the, the number one donor, you know, valuable U.S. taxpayer dollars to ensure that who we think we are assisting, we are actually assisting. So is it perfect? No. Uh, is it a strong system in terms of an accountability, accountability point of view? Yes. And it's one that we have trusted, but we obviously continue to take a look at. There are also issues related to, in terms of whether or not the, the coordination issue related to donor coordination and accountability issues are brought up in this. There is a forum that's been established in the international community under the leadership of the UN's Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Assistance called the Syrian Humanitarian Forum. And we've tried very hard, again, to protect humanitarian operations to try to keep the humanitarian separate from the political. And it's in this forum that we actually look in great detail at these issues related to monitoring, accountability, needs assessment, gaps, filling those gaps, and so on. And that sort of work will certainly continue. Uh, on, the, on the issue related to transitions and, and what we've learned, in addition to the very strong internal U.S. government coordination mechanisms that Mark mentioned, I mean, we have separate, certainly, uh, groups dedicated to looking at things like essential services, for example, demining issues after, uh, uh, after a transition in terms of return, humanitarian assistance requirements, which of course won't go away um, as soon as Assad leaves, that sort of thing. And that sort of marrying of the, the diplomatic political uh, with the development is very important to make sure that we're, we're working uh, as seamlessly as possible. And I think I'll just stop there. Thanks. Just a quick note on this transition issue to add, what, uh, add to what Mark and Kelly said. Uh, it's a very tricky issue. Um, who do you hold accountable and how on both sides of the conflict? Uh, who governs and how and when on all sides of the conflict? Um, it's not an easy question to answer, but there certainly are lessons to be learned from not just the Arab Spring in the region, but from other places. Um, the one thing that is true is that knowledge and expertise on these kinds of transition issues has increased over the last few years. So you do see State Department, CSO office, USAID, OTI, almost every organization in town has experts now to focus on transition, or, uh, transition issues. Even many universities in town have programs that focus on this. So it's not an easy question, but it's one that's getting more attention, which is useful. Okay. Three last questions, and then we're going to wrap this up, and people can stay okay, here, and then Sharon, and then the gentleman here, I think. Oh, wait, wait, sorry. Sorry. Here and Sharon, one on that side for equality's sake, and that's, and then we'll wrap it up. And they'll, some, they'll be available afterwards. Understandably, there, it seems to me that the reticence of minority groups in uh, Syria, the Alawites as well as other minority groups, relates to concern uh, for security in a post, uh, if the regime falls. 
Um, I'm wondering how we are treating this and how we are dealing with the, uh, the opposition in planning for this as well as other contingencies, you know, both with respect to, um, you know, in, enticing, enticing minority groups, you know, to support the opposition, which they have not done uh, in great numbers so far, as well as, you know, just assuring that post, uh, you know, the fall of the regime, um, security can be protected. One other quick question. Um, at $200 million, um, I sense, you know, that the U.S. is the largest single uh, uh, contributor to humanitarian assistance. Um, I sense from what people are saying a certain amount of frustration there with respect to the participation or lack of participation in other you know, other countries. Is that correct and what do we do about it? Okay, thanks. And I would add just to your first question that there's also the question of integrating uh, wealthy merchants who are self-exiled, who are outside of Syria, um, who are going to be essential to any future for, for Syria, who are Sunni Christian largely, who are of course not Alawi and have other interests. Sharon, go ahead. Um, and, and in fact, my question follows exactly on his last point. Um, several times today people have made, made statements that the U.S. is the largest single contributor with this $200 million figure. Um, that's substantially lower than the figure that the Turkish government claims these high-end um, refugee camps that they're supporting has, have cost them. And I know there is great sensitivity on their part about sort of getting credit for doing their fair share. I guess I'm, I'm a little bit curious about how you're, how you're making the statement that our contribution is the largest and how are you taking into con consideration the, the extremely high costs of the neighboring countries like Turkey who are providing um, incredible assistance in these camps. Perhaps in kind. Okay, and last question here. Thank you. My name is Samir Bhaitamuni. Actually, my question is for Mark and uh, Kelly. Are you, are you pushing for no-fly zone to reduce the humanitarian problem? Because the jets and the helicopters in Syria now are making the difference, a big difference, destroying hospitals, schools, and uh, other uh, essential activities. Thank you. Okay. Why don't we start? All right. Uh, let me discuss the issue, uh, I mentioned it a bit in my previous remarks, about security for minority groups. And I'll just reiterate that, you know, we are looking at it from a humanitarian perspective uh, in terms of programmatic interventions. And uh, as it was said, Kelly and I just returned from meetings in Cairo with the newly formed coalition. And this is not really an area that, uh, that uh, we're particularly focused on uh, with them. There are other groups that are, and absolutely that's a, that's a huge uh, issue that's being discussed by U.S. government with the, the newly formed coalition, but we did have some side conversations about it with respect to humanitarian assistance. And they, they absolutely understand this, uh, this issue and the problem. Um, uh, you know, I, I, we're, we're doing what we can. Certainly, I think uh, their credibility to govern will be based on how things are, are uh, handled when the fall of Assad does occur. Uh, so I, I think it's a, an issue that we're all seized upon. But it's not going to be easy. I mean, uh, I've been in, in many conflict situations now, and when you look at the level of violence that's occurred in Syria, uh, it, it's created a huge problem with ter in terms of uh, increasing sectarian tension. So uh, I certainly don't want to give the image that this is, this is uh, um, being handled to the extent that it's going to need to be. It's going to be an ongoing problem. It's something that uh, we'll continue to have discussions on. Uh, then just, to, and Kelly will probably want to say more on this, but on the issue of the Turkish contribution, you're absolutely right to point that out, but we were speaking about bilateral donors and aid inside Syria. And in terms of the largest overall contributor in dollar figures, Turkey has claimed 450 million, is that right, Kelly? For its assistance to uh, uh, those who've been displaced across uh, the border into Turkey. So that is the largest donation overall. Um, and then finally, uh, are we pushing for a no-fly zone? Um, let me just state that uh, the assistance that the U.S. government provides is based on uh, its needs driven, it's impartial, and we try not to get in, into those issues. Um, it's a, it seems like a no-brainer that uh, given what the air power that's being used, that that that's be a, a logical step 
to improve the humanitarian conditions inside Syria, but again, I'll go back to the, the fact that I've, I've worked in a lot of conflict zones, and there's a lot of components to putting in a no-fly zone, and that has all sorts of potential ramifications. So it's not an easy either-or situation. It's not something that we're going to get into in, in terms of advocacy one way or the other, but I know from discussions that have been taking place that uh, it's certainly one of many options that's, that's under consideration, but it's, it's not a, a simple black and white uh, um, process or, or potential outcome if you do go that way. So a couple of points to add to, uh, to Mark's comments. Uh, I think you perceive the frustration in, in the right way. Uh, and I think we have um, been challenged somewhat given how discreet some of our assistance is flowing to be able to communicate just how much the United States government is doing in humanitarian terms. That said, there was no intention to undercut what the neighbors have done. Um, in addition to Turkey, I think you would hear Jordanian representatives saying similar things in terms of what their economy uh, and their own budgets have supported in terms of the Syrians uh, inside Jordan and in, in fact released an appeal uh, earlier this year for $400 million uh, in bilateral support. Uh, in terms of the way that we respond, uh, it's normally through these international appeals. Uh, and in terms of those appeals, we were making that comparison in terms of the United States government, government being the number one donor. We are trying to the extent that we can to look at components of those appeals that will support the requirements that Turkey and Jordan uh, Iraq and Lebanon have put on the table in terms of ways that we can support sustaining the populations outside of the country. Uh, but obviously we need others to step up. Syria is one of the largest humanitarian crises in the world today, but it's not the only one. We have the Sahel, obviously, Sudan, and other humanitarian emergencies around the world. And I think what we're seeing is donors trying to balance to the extent possible these competing needs, which continue to rise. So obviously, in the, with the fragility and, and the, uh, the difficulty in terms of being able to predict budgets, I think some of the other donors and those we talked to in Cairo and in Geneva in the middle of this month are challenged by responding to the enormous requirements and trying to target and prioritize needs. The other issue that I think Mark referred to in his earlier comments was this issue of data and to be able to identify more clearly where the gaps are inside the country in particular um, some donors are, are, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Do you keep the, the assistance flowing because you know needs are there? Do you wait for the perfect information to be able to know exactly where you need to go? Uh, we've been a bit more forward leaning in terms of trying to get that assistance out there with imperfect information. And I think and hope that we will see other donors come on board as that information improves over the coming uh, weeks and months. Thanks. Just to add um, this question of how do you ensure protect minority rights, and not just minority, but all rights, um, now as well as during a transition, it's not just the U.S. government that's focusing on some of this stuff, but there are other organizations. The Public International Law and Policy Group has done a lot of research on this. I don't know if anybody from here is, from that organization is here right now, but it is an issue. You're right. Uh, and it's a very complicated issue. Um, and just to throw out Unrelated, uh, I literally am just now getting reports that there's heavy fighting outside Damascus. Electricity is down in some areas. The airport has been shut. So even, you know, regardless of the internet, regardless of what now, reporting is still flowing in and out very quickly. Um, obviously, some of this needs to be verified, et cetera, but there is information coming in and out, going back to that earlier question about it. Okay, well, thank you. That wraps it up. So I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, IRD for helping us to sponsor this, the great uh, panel that we've had today, and our MEA staffers for helping us out. Thank you so much.